Even with the financial arrangements almost sorted, though they would only be finalized in 1938, the couple's future remained uncertain. For example, where were they to live? It was clear they were not welcome in Britain for the moment, and the decision was not helped by the suggestion that the Duke would now have to pay income tax. There were primarily, there were preliminary negotiations to buy cloisters, which is the, was this huge Gothic residence outside of Baltimore built in 1932, but that came to nothing. And then in March, Wallace and her maid Mary Burke and 26 pieces of luggage moved to Chateau de Condé, a fairy tale castle of high towers, pointed turrets and Gothic doorways in preparation for her third wedding. Now, it's very interesting how she found this chateau because it was all through her old friends, the Rogers. Now, remember I talked about them at the beginning of the episode. Herman Rogers was the husband of her friend, Catherine Rogers, remember? And they had met in China when she was seeking a divorce from her first husband. I don't understand this relationship. I don't understand who Herman is to her. I don't understand any of it, but this house was quite stunning. It was built by the fifth richest man in America and his American wife, Fern, and it had set about, and they had set about modernizing the chateau, which had been built in 1508, installing state-of-the-art facilities that included central heating, ensuite bathrooms, a $15,000 telephone system with a full-time telephonist, art deco bathrooms, huge refrigerators, a bar in the old kitchen, which still had the hooks for game, and a gym with the latest exercise equipment. An underground passage led to an old hunting lodge, which Bedeau, the builder of the, or the renovator of the home, had converted into a billiard room. Now, this is the thing that I find so interesting, and this is why I raised my eyebrows to this entire thing. Herman Rogers, the one who had helped her to find this home, the one who was friends with the original owner and uh, renovator of the home, had decided that he was going to, and his wife, were going to move into the house with Wallace Simpson, but that he was going to take a bedroom that was right next door to Wallace's bedroom in an adjoining sitting room with a day bed. As she later wrote, Herman decided to take this for himself. He'd slept in a room adjoining mine with a gun under his pillow ever since I had arrived from England more than three months before. Upstairs were several other bedrooms of which Catherine took one. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? All right, her friend Catherine's husband has decided to sleep in a room that is next to hers. There's a door connecting the two bedrooms and he hasn't stopped guarding Wallace Simpson since the minute she came over from England. He is in such a protective state over her that he needs to sleep right next to her with a gun under her pillow in case anybody tries to get her. Now, she had had death threats, but remember there was protective agents who were following Wallace Simpson from England. Um, They're afraid that she's gonna make some inroads with the political elite in Germany. So she had protective officers around her, at least two, I believe the book said. And yet this Herman feels that he needs to be sleeping right next to her with a gun under her pillow. So concerned is he about her safety? And Catherine is just sleeping in some random bedroom upstairs. Catherine, what's going on? You know, it's like, she, uh, this would not work for me. This would not work for me. Uh-uh. If my spouse wanted to sleep in a bedroom next to somebody of the opposite sex and they have an adjoining room and then I'm just supposed to find some other room in the house to sleep in, we'd have problems. Well, she was living in this new home, which I suppose is going to be the one that she and David will live in after they can finally get married. She changed her name um, by deed poll to Wallace Warfield and she was waiting for that marriage to go ahead. I'm not really sure why she felt the need to change her name at this point, because she'd gone on as Wallace Simpson for a while, even after the divorce, but now suddenly she wants it to be Wallace Warfield. Who knows? So, as you'll recall, this whole chapter is all about them waiting for the wedding, waiting for them to get the okay that they can get married, waiting for the solicitors who have been probing into all of the craziness around the divorce of Wallace Simpson from her second husband, they're waiting for them to get the go ahead that they can get married. The answer came on March 18th when Sir Thomas Barnes, the treasury solicitor announced that there had been no evidence of collusion and the marriage could proceed, though he had not interviewed the one servant who might have established the truth. 
Now, Wallace Simpson's servant, Mary Burke, could have certainly provided all the details necessary if they really wanted to know what was going on behind the scenes with Wallace, her husband, and David. But they didn't bother to ask her, and the reason was it's not the practice of the king's proctor to endeavor to get information from the servants. Oh, the servants are the ones who have the information, dude. Like, do you not understand these people talk? They're the ones who knows what's really going on. If you want to get any information, I'd go talk to the servants first. Anyway, he didn't bother. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It's clear that evidence did exist of collusion between the three of those people, David, Wallace, and, and her husband, Ernest Simpson. Ernest Simpson had obligingly been caught in bed with his future wife, Mary Raffrey, so that Wallace could sue him for adultery, so that she could get out of the marriage. And then there was the question of payment. Then, of course, he's going to have to pay her this big fee, you know, oh, you commit adultery. Now you've got to pay alimony. And then there is paper trails that show that he did pay out a sum of money to Simpson. But then it is thought that the king refunded Ernest Simpson those costs. Weird. It's a weird situation. And then, of course, perjury was involved. But the king's proctor chose not to use any of this evidence. And they did not use the evidence of David's adultery with Wallace in Budapest in 1935, uh, where there is an unsigned three-page memo confirming, and that memo still remains on file. But nobody bothered about the fact that Simpson had been wandering around having her own affairs on her husband. And nobody bothered about the weird transactional situation between Wallace, oh no, I just walked in and my husband's having an affair. Oh, you owe me money. Okay, here's the money. And then the king comes and pays that money back. Like, it's very weird. You know, it's all so that they could get the divorce, so that they could get married, you know? Um, because he really, really, really wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, even though she would have been perfectly fine just being his mistress. And apparently, Ernest Simpson was okay with that arrangement, too. I mean, he was kind of pimping her out, honestly, because he was lining his pockets for quite a quite a while with the king's money. So, it's, it's incredibly weird. But... They just, honestly, I think they just want to wash their hands of it, let them go marry the woman. You know, the evidence was there if they wanted to find it about all the collusion, but I don't think they did. I think they just wanted him to pack up, go, shut up. We don't want the problem anymore. Okay, now we come to the final story of this chapter. It's a little bit tragic. I'm very sad for Slipper, his little dog that he loved to carry around. At the beginning of April, the Duke had sent his Cairn Terrier, Slipper, sometimes called Mr. Lou, to Wallace at Candee. And the next day, while chasing a rabbit, Slipper was bitten by a viper. Though rushed to the local vet in Tours, it died that night. And she writes to him and says, in the most melodramatic thing I've ever heard, my darling, I've just given Herman Mr. Lou's rug to wrap his little body in before Herman buries him. Even God seems to have forgotten we for surely this is an unnecessary sorrow for us, reported Wallace. He was our dog, not yours or mine, but us. And he loved us both so. And now the principal guest at the wedding is no more. Ah, uh, well, as Lowney says in his last sentence of the chapter, the death of that dog was not good portent for their marriage. No, it was not. And Wallace is just, She's such a master manipulator this entire book. You know, I mean, she's either a master manipulator or David's an idiot. I think both are sort of true. But like, you know, I'm not saying she didn't care about the dog. I'm sure she did love the dog. But the way she writes about it is just so melodramatic. You know, it's like, how could God be raining this suffering on us? And even he's forgotten about us. And this dog was us. It was our love. It was a picture of our love. And, and, and the only one who would have been happy for us at our wedding was Mr. Lou slash slippers. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't want to mock their sadness. It's it's sad to lose a dog, but just the way she writes about it is just so, I mean, I, th I just like, couldn't you just be like, I'm devastated the dog is dead instead of trying to be like, this dog represented our love and now our love is dying in the ground cold. I don't know. 